So questions? Okay. <laughs> um, you mentioned personal history having an effect. What are your thoughts on psychoneuroimmunology? You know, I actually, believe it or not, I studied that when I was in med school. And what, I did a horrible thing to rats. I infected them with herpes. <laughs> yes, I gave rats herpes in their paws. And then I put them in uh, especially uh, bred rats for agitation, black balbacy. And then we put them in conical tubes and, and stressed the heck out of them. And then we saw the effects of our immune system on that. We know for a fact that stress, uh, psychological stress, can definitely affect the release of certain uh, white cells in the body, it's most specifically cytotoxic T lymphocytes and natural killer cells. And these are involved in the um, cellular immunity. So there, there is a journal online, if you're such inclined, that is entitled, uh, I think it's uh, Psychoimmunology. Uh, and they, we, we, we do believe that there is a link between stress, obviously, and infection, and stress probably in autoimmune or immune-mediated uh, uh, conditions. So yeah, I think it's effective. Any other questions, please? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I would seek them early. Um, I think, yeah, at diagnosis, close to diagnosis, um, because I, I really think that um, where I, unfortunately, I'd much, like I tell patients, I'd much rather see you early on your course of disease than have you at a point where you're just out of control. And so I think, um, I think it is absolutely, uh, we've, we've changed the way we've done things in this country, and I think, I think it's very reasonable to ask your rheumatologists, or, and I work a lot very closely with the rheumatologists in my area, uh, that we co-manage. And you know, I help manage the symptoms, and they help manage the, you know, the immunologic portions of it, but I, I would much rather patients get involved early. We used to say in chronic pain, uh, chronic pain was anything over six months, We've changed that diagnosis, so uh, we, we're changing our, our kind of beliefs from just covering up pain to actually be active managers and participants in, in wellness, and that's really, I think, early on is a good way to go. I, I really believe that. Yes, sir. Great. Uh, a few years ago, my insurance company, after having paid for physical therapy for various issues related yeah. to this, took the position that this is an incurable disease. We only pay for physical therapy for people who can be returned to normal. Is that something you commonly run into? And if so, how do you get them to pay? <laughs> you know, I usually make a phone call in them and say, uh, you know, um, so you believe in euthanasia? You know, it's <laughs> seriously. Um, the, yeah, I mean, no, um, there's enough clinical evidence out there to, to support that physical therapy is helpful in this area. You gotta remember um, who reviews those claims. And so when it gets re initially reviewed, you're gonna talk to somebody that's probably not medical trained and that re is reading from a script. You wanna send a letter directly to the medical director and ask your rheumatologist or someone like me, your uh, pain management specialist to write and draft the letter. I've never had it after it got that stage got denied. You've got, unfortunately, you've got to be your own advocate, and that's what I, I, I want you to do. But when it gets to that point, make sure that your doc is getting involved. Um, because that, the, remember, the incentive of most insurance companies is to pay nothing, and it's not the right thing to do in your disease. There is good clinical data out there. And so for every article that they can show you that it doesn't help, we can show them more that it does. And so get, get involved early. And in, in some other case, I'd, I'd write a letter and call. Uh, and I've called myself, so ask your doctor to help you out. Yeah, we're happy to do that. We're advocates. Ma'am? Um, this is not on. This is, whoa, Texas, but uh, medical marijuana. And yeah. also, part of the reason I'm asking, I have not tried it myself, but I do know at my pain management doctor, if your urine tests positive for it, then they're not going to give you opiates. Right. And friends I have right. in other states swear by it. Right. So this is a dilemma, and this is a question. dilemma I hit head on. And when I was the chief of um, a New Mexico VA system, I covered a couple states. I covered Colorado. I covered policy for Arizona, 
uh, Western Texas and New Mexico. Colorado had medical marijuana, now they have regular marijuana. New Mexico did too. My solution to that problem was I stopped testing for marijuana. Um, and my personal beliefs are that yes, there are certain cannabinoid receptors in the brain. There's a lot of research going on now that does show efficacy for pain. It also shows not just pain, but we've also looked at PTSD um, from our troops in marijuana, and it, it seems to be effective. I'd much rather have a patient tell me, Doc, I use marijuana, than I drink a fifth of alcohol with my pain medicine, because this interaction of alcohol is going to be fatal, not so much marijuana. Just the risk is we would use any agent that could make us tired or drowsy and things like that. But in Texas, uh, is a very strict state as far as its DPS. Um, and um, what I have recommended is you don't, we no longer keep it on our common screen. And so uh, the board tells us to do it. But yeah, yes, you, it is a problematic, uh, a problematic thing that I see. I mean, I've, I've come into that uh, a couple times. Um, we do currently test for everything. I do discuss it with the patient in detail. Uh, I tell the patient, because Texas will audit me if I do um, write opiates concomitantly, I tell them I can't write you opiates at this time if that's what you want to do, but I'm not going to drop you as a patient whatsoever. We're going we're to use other adjuvants for it. And so um, that happened just the other day. Um, it happens frequently. And so the good thing I know, and I had had spent a year um, in, uh, with doing research in, 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 with major pharmaceutical companies uh, as a consultant. And we are going to see a lot of clinical trials now starting with pain and marijuana. Um, and so I think within 10 years, I think what we're going to have is we're going to have you know, drug companies that we're going to have different, you know, obviously ingestible forms of it, uh, things like that. Other than smoking, it carries the same risk as smoking if you smoke, but other agents, it, it can be helpful for both pain and for anxiety of it. So that's kind of been the way I've done with it um, because, because Texas is very difficult to get through. Um, I'm hoping um, that nationally, uh, maybe perhaps Supreme Court or some, you know, will take the bull by the horns and say, okay, this is it. Because this is a major problem. It's like when I was in New Mexico, I'm in a state that allows it. But uh, since I worked at a federal facility, can't write it. Uh, technically, in, um, in facilities uh, that are run by the federal government, the state usually trumps the federal government with the exception of DEA agent or um, pharmaceuticals, which is a, is a big, big pain in the butt. But yeah, Texas is tough. Yes, ma'am. Yep. <laughs> Thanks. Um, how much does the age of the patient weigh into whether you're willing to prescribe opiates and which opiates you would prescribe? Yeah. Especially like younger patients. Yeah. No, it does. I mean, I I, I have I have younger patients uh, that are in their their uh, you know I typically see adults. I do see patients as young as 15. Uh, most of the time you know, we're going to get to, we're going to go through other therapies before we prescribe opiates. But, you know, I've had a 14-year-old um, uh, female with severe trauma, severe autoimmune disease that I do have on that. So I don't look at the age itself. I look at the disease burden and the pain burden. And that's why I say everybody's individual. Now, you're going to see a lot of pain clinics. There's no way on God's green earth am I going to give a 17-year-old opiates. And your average 17-year-old, I probably would not give opiates to. But, um, but in someone who has that, is it ethical to deny pain care? And that's the, that's the million-dollar question. I don't think so. And as long as your provider and you, uh, or the patient, um, does what we do, is we bring our patients in every two months. We go over the management of their medications if they're on opiates. Um, we do counseling on opiates because of the risk of, now we've seen all this stuff go on with overdose and, and, and prints. Everyone I prescribe opiates to, I also provide. Now, thank God, that they allowed us to prescribe Narcan to reverse it. So there's a device, it looks like an EpiPen, an auto-injector, and it's called Viso. 
And so anybody that is on opiates, I prescribe that because in case their kids or their family or somebody would get into it accidentally, the least we can save somebody's life rather than just say, no, we're not going to do anything. I don't think that's right. But the uh, long answer to your question, um, I, I, it really depends on the individual patient. I'm not going to say no to a 16 or 17 year old if there is, we've done everything, we've tried everything, and that's the progression on the, on the ladder, yes, then, then we do it. We monitor them closely just like everybody else, and, and, that's, and I think that's fine. There is one concern with opiates, and, and it's specifically men, though, and we can make this argument. Men, um, it can decrease testosterone. So you want to make sure we do test. I do test for that. I test That's for that in most men because some of the fatigue that people experience may not just be the fatigue from our disease. It may be from hypotestosteronism, which opiates can cause. Chronic use of opiates can cause hypotestosteronism. So we do we do check that in men. We haven't seen as much in females with estrogen, but in men we it's it's a definite entity. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, no, I don't know what they're called, non-opioid painkillers, like tramadol kind of mm -hmm. thing? Yeah. yeah, they're fine. Tramadol is a very weak opioid, but it works um, more like an antidepressant. It works on norepinephrine, serotonin. So it's, it's a fine medication. The, the, the issue with tramadol is that you have to be careful because it can interact with a lot of drugs, especially antidepressants. And it can cause what's called serotonergic syndrome. So. You know, what happens in that state is people can get very, very red or hyperemic, they can get high temperatures, and they can have seizures, and I, I have seen that. So we really, if you're not saying that I haven't prescribed them on people with those drugs, but I usually lower the dose or minimize the dose of the tramadol on those patients. Tramadol is pretty helpful, we find, for myofascial pain. A lot of patients who have fibromyalgia, it can be helpful for. And so, yeah, that, that's absolutely, you know, we do write for that. There's some extended release forms of it that have hit the market now. But generally, we want to keep it under 400 milligrams a day, total dose, for anybody. And anybody who is on SSRIs, I try to keep under 100 milligrams a day so that, to minimize that risk. But you, you have to be aware of that, that risk with the patient. We do discuss that in detail with them. Anybody else? Yeah. I can ask for you if you like. Where's your uh, office located? San Antonio. Oh, okay. yeah. But you know, we have patients from all over, so. <laughs> yep. And I have patients from Dallas that come once in a while. My pain management doctor. She works in one of the clinics. Uh -huh. Uh, and there's just two doctors in there, and I see her once a month, mm -hmm. and she writes my scripts. Mm -hmm. Bye. Yeah. Spend there's any spend any time with a patient. Right. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, that's why I said when I told you when I teach, you're allowed one question. How are you doing? Then you shut up. What we do in my office is I don't sit by a computer and do this. One, I can't type. Two, I can't talk to you. <laughs> so uh, we have a medical scribe, mm -hmm. and that time is with you and me. There's nothing more important in pain management than spending time with the patient. Yeah, and, and that's, I feel like a piece of cattle. Right. Get a new doctor. Do you have any list of pain management doctors here in Dallas? I can find out for you. Yeah, and, and there's some wonderful doctors, and I'll try to get it to... Aline and, and, and Richard, but there, there are some good centers. You know, the multidisciplinary approach was very vogue, and then it went away because, you know, everybody just started writing, now it's coming back. So it is hard to find what, what we call pain rehabilitation. I'm not meaning opiate rehabilitation, but we call it pain rehabilitation centers. If you can find a center that, that does pain rehabilitation, um, that's wonderful. And some of those programs were actually some, we, we had, the, the military has a real nice one in San Antonio. The patient, uh, it's about a six week program and that's your job for six weeks. So you go to class, you go, you meet with obviously the pain doctors, your physical therapist, you meet with the behavioral health person, you meet with the nutritionist, you go to classes, you go to exercise and water therapy, and you do nothing but that for six months, or not six months, six weeks, so you get the basis of it. And it's 
phenomenal the results that people get from that. In the day and age, if we look at cost effectiveness, that is far more cost effective than sitting and, and prescribing drugs. So now Medicare has said, we as pain management doctors did ourselves bad. I mean, we just gave people, everybody got shots, we call them block shots, or uh, block shops or pain pill mills. They gave people a bad name. But the only thing that good came out of it is Medicare says, I want to see increased efficacy, meaning I want to see people getting better. It's hard to do that unless you spend time with your patients. So yeah, there are centers that do that um, up here. A lot of the academic centers will do that. Um, some of the smaller non-academic centers, it, it, it's tough to spend uh, that time with patients, but it's important. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. Questions? Sure. Extension-based Yeah, extension-based, and, and, and so what some of the physical therapists do, and you can see, you can actually go online. Um, there's there's things like foam rollers. They look like the noodles in the pool. Okay, and if you gently kind of place them on your back, and you do that, you know, just for about 10 or 15 minutes a day, just let your normal body weight uh, kind of extend it. Especially if you suffer from some of the upper kyphosis, you're not going to break anything. But that's kind of what we want to work on, so that there's different muscles extensors in the back that kind of help instead of pulling us forward, are going to stretch us out. Also, our pectoralis muscles often become pretty stiff in, in spondylitis. So stretching of those muscles, uh, they'll often work on. And, and, and you know, it, it's tough, but uh, those are the things that seem to be more effective. Yeah. So you want to just discuss that with your physical therapist. They'll know exactly what you're talking about, you know. But if you look on the internet, those, you know, get a cheap one, because anything that's labeled medical, you just up the price about 500%. So, you know, even just getting a rolled up towel kind of in the middle of your back, an extension, uh, you know, a few times a day is good. Yeah, well, I, I think, um, we, I, you know, nowadays, they're making, physical therapy, or a lot of them are requiring a doctorate level now. So they're, they're getting pretty savvy. I mean, a lot of them are getting pretty good. So there are, there are a lot of very, very good physical therapists out there these days. So, you know, kind of shop around, ask questions. Uh, what do you do? Do you have hydrotherapy? Do you do other things? And, and kind of be in that, you know, unfortunately, we have to be our own advocates a lot in what we do. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh, country, <laughs> to the Spondylitis Association and to the veterans. Ah, oh, it's my pleasure. Um, and also, I, I want to thank you for talking about complementary alternatives. I go to Mayo Clinic, and I'm in an inter the integrated program. Right, they have They're toe dipping right now in Arizona, and I was fortunate enough to be able to get in there. Right. I have mindfulness. What? I'm sorry. Um, Mindfulness, spirituality, which spirituality to me is being out in my garden, Correct. being with a pet, right. being with my husband, mm -hmm. um, and biofeedback, and paste breathing, and meditation, and Mediterranean diet. Virtually everything you had up there is what I'm doing right now. Good. And that has enabled me to get off of social security. There you go. So thank you very much for yeah. um, talking you know, about that. And a few people have said they didn't know what mindfulness Mindfulness, and, and I'm not a great expert on this, and I'm not going to put my wife on the spot because nurses are much better at doing this than this, but mindfulness is, and I've only done it a couple times, I'm not great at it, but is, is controlling your breathing, uh, being aware of your environment, like, so your foot, your, so let's say you were sitting, you'd be sitting, you'll be, kind of close your eyes, you take a deep breath, and then you function on you know, the chair that's holding my weight and, thing, and things like that. So it's trying to relieve external stimuli that's coming in and to be in the moment more. And it can, yeah, absolutely. And that's the things like the alpha stimulus stuff that, you know, when, when, when our behavioral health doc said, you know, try this, I'm like, it's a walk, man. What what am I, is this ECT therapy? Am I going to shock myself that I feel better? But no, it really does help quite a bit. And the Army has done a large trial on that with uh, traumatic brain injury patients. And it, it really, really has been helpful and, and helpful for other types of pain management. Yep. 
I just want to add something real quick. You're talking about mindfulness. There's a um, an app. It's called Headspace. Cool. And it's great. It's it's a free app for like 10, th 10 times, and it's really basic, and it teaches you how to have that. And it's it's awesome. I work with um, a chiropractor, acupuncturist. Great. And so I, I really appreciate all that you're doing as well. And we work with a... Um, um, a pain management doctor as well. So I, I yeah. really appreciate that because it is a multimodal thing. Oh, so absolutely. I think, you huge. know, that's, um, I get frustrated with other professionals when they say never, because I don't think never is a good answer or not, you know, and that, that's not looking at the individual level. That's looking at something at population and you're all unique. You know, I tell what my patients is you're all unique you're not different from a lot of patients I see, so therefore you're th what works for, for you is maybe not going to work for him or her and this, but that's why the patient you know, really has to be involved in this, and patient's family members have to be involved with this because they are the ones that drive us, that motivate us, that get us off our butts when we don't feel like getting up in the morning. And I can't say enough about that. So thanks. Cool. Awesome. Paced breathing app. Thank you. And the mindfulness app again was, guys? Headspace. Headspace. Okay, I've looked that one up. That sounds pretty cool. Also, you were talking about the back extension. Yeah. Using a noodle or a rolled up towel. Yeah. What about uh, those, uh, those exercise balls, those big... They're fine. The, the, the thing is, and, and, and some of us, and I know with, with kind of my hips and stuff, I, I, patients can tend to fall off those things and hurt themselves. That, that's the only thing. I, they're good, um, but I, I, you, you want to make sure you either have a spotter present or something like that because I have seen patients do them and whack, and then we just d dislocated or broke a hip or something like that. And then, you know, I'm a bad doctor because they say get an exercise ball. And, and the funniest was when my uh, colleague had it at the thing and he was using it. It's like one of those things we had when we were kids, bouncing it, boom, right in his butt. And it wasn't good. So, you know, just they're, they're good and they're excellent, but I think sometimes they, they do require a lot more coordination than I have. Yeah, so I'd, I'd start, they're, they're good to have, I just to be careful with them. Yep. It doesn't support the neck. No, either. no. I noticed when I've done it. No, and that's why like Pilates and stuff, I, I did terrible at it because I couldn't keep my neck up. And plus a lot of us, you know, uh, I don't know if like you, but I know I gotta prop myself up like King with the Sphinx before I go to bed, you know, cause I can't get my neck comfortable. I always feel like I'm kinda hanging there. And what I've told patients to do at nighttime, since sleep is so important, is to get yourself one of those airplane pillows that are really thick. Not the kind of wimpy ones, but that are thick. They're better than putting you in a brace. If I put you in a brace, you're going to get atrophy of your neck, and you're going to look like a, pop, you know, a, a pencil neck. But at night, it, it, there is true. You know, we've all said to ourselves, I've slept wrong in the morning. I can't, I, I can't get it. So what I recommend is those uh, horseshoe pillows that it's nice and firm. When you go to Walmart, pay five, ten bucks, and it just prevents you from kind of laying in the wrong position. Because if you stay in this position for an hour or two with spondylitis, you know, your joints are going to hurt like crazy, and then you're going to look like Quasimodo for the rest of the day, and you know, it's one of those things. So I agree. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, it so much. You.